ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನ ತಿಂಧಸ್ಯಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಕಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷೂರು ನೀಲಿ ತಮ್ಯೇನ ಥಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀಲ ಪ್ರಭುಪಾದ ಸೆಡ್ ದಟ್ ಅವರ್ ಮೂಮೆಂಟ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಎ ರಿಲಿಜಿಯಸ್ ಮೂಮೆಂಟ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋ ರಿಯಲ್ ವರ್ಡ್ ಫಾರ್ ರಿಲಿಜನ್ ಇನ್ ಇನ್ ಎನಿ ಇನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಇಟ್ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಅ ಸೆಕ್ಟೇರಿಯನ್ ಮೂಮೆಂಟ್ these are all actually there's no even our movement is so non-sectarian that there's not even any real well religious in this in the sense that it's there in the western languages it's not the the term isn't even there in indian languages yeah in western languages or, or just like in english the word there is religion um that that means it, it has the connotation of something which is something one believes in and it's part of your life and the idea that there are different religions now of course in indian languages they talk about hindu dharma christian dharma muslim dharma and so on but in traditional indian culture there was no idea of like there being different religions but rather the idea was that is different manifestations of dharma actually within indian culture there was anyway it's getting too far then we get into our philosophical i better keep it simple um yeah prabhu said our religion when prashil power is asked about his this religion he said it's not a religion it's a philosophical cultural and educational movement meant for the respiritualization of the world so philosophical cultural and educational now just last sunday in bangalore i gave a lecture on the difference differences between um modern education and vedic education education is vidya is it it means knowledge but education is something different isn't it that shiksha isn't it edu well education can mean usually in english when you say education it means the act of educating it doesn't mean what you've learned so it means more like shiksha shiksha vidhan or something like that because there's no difference between western vidya and eastern vidya vidya is neither eastern nor western vidya simply means knowledge shiksha you can say yeah shiksha vidhan or something like that yeah vidya there's no difference west or east here in india 2 plus 2 equals 4 and believe it or not in the western countries it's the same until you start studying quantum mechanics but that's something different altogether that everything becomes crazy <laughs> anyway never mind about that anyway there were um uh there are about education a couple of points more i wanted to make that i forgot to make in bangalore uh well education reflects the uh overall aspirations of the society education seeks to mold the child into a person who will be a, a a suitable member of the society so in vedic culture dharma is considered the most important attribute of a human being so the training is in the the foremost training is in dharma or as shila prabhat said the uh the the most important feature of gurukul training is character training training people boys in character now uh in modern society the most important thing is adharma i guess so the most important thing is sense gratification uh and for attainment of sense gratification there is a uh, competitive society 
It's the, in the modern age, we live in what's called the consumer society, in which people try to, businessmen try to incite people to buy more and more things. And therefore, people have to uh, earn money to buy these things. At the present time, there are two very important events going on in the world. One is the Soccer World Cup. And the other, which is generally considered a very important event every year, but which has been overshadowed this year by the Soccer World Cup, is the Wimbledon Tennis Competition. But actually, of course, these have no real importance at all. But they have been promoted by the mass media. I remember, I think it must be in the early 1980s, I saw in the Telegraph, uh, whatever, some newspaper in Calcutta, there was about three lines in the newspaper saying that Argentina had won the Soccer World Cup. Oh, no, 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 it's about no, no, no. three lines like that. And I was surprised because... It was just like three lines, whereas in the country I come from, during the World Cup soccer, everyone forgets everything else pretty much. It's like uh, the perverted reflection of being completely absorbed in Krishna consciousness. So in India there was no interest in this. But now there is interest. How has that happened? Has something altered in the Indian people's genes that they suddenly became interested in soccer? It's some kind of Darwinian uh, chance adjustment that all of a sudden Indians became interested in soccer. It's not Siddhanta. Darwinian matam. Don't say Siddhanta. Change your language. Your language is wrong. They changed the. Uh, they took the Sanskrit words and misused them. Anyway, the reason why Indians, and now I'm making a psychological analysis, why Indians, are, at least some of them, are interested in soccer is because of the Times of India, the, uh, the Hindu, the, uh, the TV stations, and so on. Or the Deccan Herald in this part of the world. Isn't it? That's the most important paper in, Andra, in English. Deccan Chronicle. Sorry, sorry. My... Profound obeisances to the uh, Deccan Chronicle owner. What are they going to do when they, they split the country, split the state? Anyway, so uh, they have publicized this. Now these soccer stars, as they are called, they get paid uh, huge amounts of money to play one game. They'll be paid like you know. It's the same in this cricket, right? They get paid crores of rupees for, for that IPL. Just how long does it last? One month or something? And they, the top players get played a few crores of rupees, right? So it, it's promoted by the press and they, they get people to take an interest in it and it's all for promoting business. These cricket stars or soccer stars, they get paid so much uh, because they... Along with the cricket or the soccer, they promote all different products like Nike shoes and uh, Coca-Cola and insurance and all kinds of things. A few years ago, my dear father told me that one soccer player, uh, his legs were short insured by his soccer club for five million pounds. But that was ten years ago, so nowadays it'd be like more like fifty million pounds. So I'm just saying all these things to show how our modern society, uh, it promotes illusion. It promotes uh, things which have no actual importance as being actually important with the idea of promoting business and selling more and more items. And the education system is based on becoming a member of this insane society. And even though in the university they have Topic: They have studies in which they are theoretically neutral. Nero picture, Nero picture. They uh, <coughs> they're not neutral because the whole aim of the the whole aim of the education is to make you a member of a society that upholds this foolishness. 
So in this business climate, uh, it, com- it thrives on competitiveness. And so in edu- right from the very, very, very beginning in education, they have exams and you have to try and come top ahead of others. So from the very beginning, children are trained in competitiveness. The most important thing is to be number one. And therefore, there's, uh, there's no character training. And therefore, it's quite common that the students simply cheat. They'll, uh, they come into the exam, they see the question, and on their mobile, they download something from the internet, and they give a great answer, but they, they, they never learned it, they just copied it. So uh, modern education promotes a competitive and corrupt atmosphere. Because, yeah, the competitive, because the, you have to get hired by a company, so they want the people with the top marks. But there's no such concept in Vedic education. It's not a competitive society. It's not producing all kinds of useless things that people don't need. People uh, are trained to whatever they're trained in. in uh, there's, uh, whether it's to be a priest or to be a teacher or to be a barber, they're trained to, to perform their service as a service, as a duty. The Brahmana teaches, but there's no question of paying him. The barber will come to your, to your house, and not that they had a barber shop, he'll come and shave and everything. He won't take any money. He does it, that's what he does. And then, uh, at, then the, uh, at, then he's called to the marriages and they'll give him something, or when there's a crop, the people, he comes every two weeks or every month and shaves. And then when the crop is there, they'll give him one or two bags of rice, like that. So uh, everyone tries to do the best they can, not to try to do better than others, to, to show themselves as better, but just as a service. And, uh, so, and, and there's no question of cheating, because there's no exams. <laughs> what, are you going, what are you going to cheat for? There's no exam. There's, you don't get any certificate or degree. Just after he goes home, after, after studying, after so many years of study, that's all. That they, people just, I, I'm, a, I'm studied under such and such guru and that's it. That's, that's all. You don't, there's, there's no certificate. So it's uh, more relaxed. It's not like you're a... There's, no one fails. There's no failures. There's, there's no successes and there's no failures. But everyone is a success in as much as they uh, learn what they're supposed to learn and then, then they discharge their duty. So the, the whole atmosphere is very, very different. The student wants to study and to be well behaved, to please his teacher. Yeah, you're saying guru, but actually the Vedic concept of guru and the modern concept of teacher, it's something completely different. The students, they want to serve their guru and please their guru, but in the modern schools, the teachers are afraid that the students will beat them. Actually, such kind of students, they wouldn't be accepted in Vedic guru calls, no question. They're just like wild animals. When Duryodhana was born, Vidur told Dhritarashtra, better you kill him now, he'll save so much problem. He was recommending infanticide. It means uh, shishu hatya. So actually, this kind of student who wants to beat the teacher, better they were killed before they even, before they grew up even. They're such bad people. I mean, even in India, that was unimaginable, even two generations ago. Now it's coming in. Two genera- the older people can remember how much the teachers were respected. Not now. India has adopted modern culture, Rakshasa culture. Another person who was very much respected in the village was the postmaster. Because... Uh, Most people couldn't read or write, so he would not only deliver the letter, but he would read it to the person. 
And then he would take the reply and write it down and send it. And in this, because he was educated, they respected him and he helped them in this way. So, see how much the culture has changed. So, Srila Prabhupada said our movement is a philosophical, cultural and educational movement. Srila Prabhupada, uh, what he wanted education to be was completely different from the modern education. Education in actual philosophy and actual culture. In modern education, there's no philosophy and no culture. Just uh, get some knowledge which will help you to function in this society. So, um, yeah, philosophy, our movement is based on the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. So I'm always recommending to the devotees, you study these books, try to understand them. And what is the culture associated with that? The modern, in the modern times, Vedic culture is in a very weak condition. There's no proper philosophical understanding. How are people worshipping this, you know, all these, uh, how many times have I said it? Sai Baba, this, that and the other. Because there's no understanding of the spiritual science. Therefore, uh, people can be very easily misled. In uh, the introduction to Sri Ishopanishad, Srila Prabhupada, it, yeah, it, it's based on a lecture called What Are the Vedas? A series of lectures. So in there, Srila Prabhupada says that in India, if one person says to tell someone to do something else, the other person may say to him, do I have to follow what you say? Is it a Vedic injunction? There was the idea that what is in the Vedas should be followed. But that idea is completely gone in modern India. What is nowadays called Hinduism is supposed to be based on uh, Vedic culture. But there's no uh, understanding of Shastra and no proper culture either. And therefore, uh, practically anyone can come along and say any nonsense and people will accept it as being spiritual. If people have uh, no knowledge means of, of what's in Shastra their position becomes pravritim cha nivritim cha janana vidur asuraha. As Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, the demons, they do not know what is to be done, what should be done, and what should not be done according to the injunction of Shastra. Yashastra vidim ud, yashastra vidhim utsrija vartate kamakarataha nasa siddhim avapnoti nasukam naparam gatim. Lord Krishna says, because the demons, they act according to their own ideas. They don't follow Shastra. Therefore, they cannot attain uh, perfection. They cannot achieve happiness. And they cannot achieve the ultimate goal of life. But that is the uh, situation of modern Hinduism. They don't know what's in Shastra. They're not particularly interested in what's in Shastra. Hindutva or... Hindutva means BJP, right? Hindu, Hindu Matam or something. You, you say, when you say Hindutva, then you start thinking of BJP, isn't it? A Hindu Matam may be better. Don't mind me correcting you all the time. I mean, I don't know Telugu, but I know a few words here right now. It's actually very, very important. To, otherwise, if you don't say the right word, then a different idea comes over. Then you'll think that we're, I'm sitting here promoting Hindutva. Next thing I'm going to be, you know, the uh, candidate for the Yadgi Rangaredi district MLA or something on the BJP ticket. You don't translate that. All right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, actually, modern modern Hinduism. Then it's. Actually, according to Krishna Bhagavad Gita, subscribing to the outlook of the demons. Because it has no Shastric basis. So Prabhupada said our movement is philosophical, cultural and educational. Therefore, uh, we are, uh, Srila Prabhupada gave us these books, Shastra. He always spoke on the basis of Shastra. So we, in our ISKCON, we must always be on the basis of everything we say and do 
must be on the basis of Shastra. Otherwise, there's no basis. Anyone can say anything they like. Asatyam apratishtante. Apratishta. There's no basis. Another lakshanam, characteristic of the demons. So, uh, we're promoting this philosophy and this education. And the culture should also be there. Because there's no proper philosophical understanding and no proper educational in these principles. And therefore the culture is also going down. There are so many ashrams all over India with so many sadhus. Sometimes for some reason or other we or I visit such ashrams. And it's very common. You'll find the sadhu with a big long beard and these karams, what's that called? Padu, wooden paduka. And they have a big TV, huge TV. And sometimes, you know, you'll be talking with the Swamiji and the TV's running on. You'll be looking at the TV from time to time. In Bhagavatam, it's stated that the ashrams of sadhus, they will become indistinguishable from ordinary Grihastha's homes. So you go in ashrams and they... If you're in South India, the usually first thing they'll ask, because they're being nice, hospitable, would you like a cup of coffee? And if you're in North India, chai piyengi, will you take tea? And you'll find these sadhus, big long beard or whatever, but just like karmis, they don't get up till 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. Not all of them, but many of them. And first thing they do is uh, coffee and uh, newspaper. Or maybe they come for arati and ring the bell and say some mantras like this. And here, five, ten minutes and finish. Isn't it? Others have seen this also. Many ashrams is like that. I wonder why are they in an ashram at all? I mean, why? I guess they get some donation from the public or something. I don't know. It's What's the point? And even in some ashram you'll go in and you'll see there's the Swamiji in saffron cloth. And the Swamini also in saffron cloth. I don't know. You'd think there'd be some little chinna chinna Swamis running around too, but maybe they have abortions. I don't know. So th- this Krishna conscious movement is meant for reviving the actual culture. Vairagya vidyanija bhakti yogam shikshartam ekam purusha parana. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Sharira Dhari Kripam Buddhya Yastamaham Prabhadhyay Savabhama Bhatta Acharya prayed to Chait- praise Chaitanya Mahaprabhu like this. That, uh, that you are this original supreme, ancient supreme personality of Godhead who has appeared in this world to teach Devotion to yourself, uh, which is based on vairagya and vidya. Vairagya means non-attachment and vidya means knowledge. So appearing in uh, the, as an, you are the ocean of mercy, appearing in the uh, form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and I surrender to you, Sabha says. So, uh, as he says, the path of bhakti it, it is based on, not exactly based on, but is characterized by vairagya and vidya, by detachment or, or non-attachment, and non-attachment to this material world, and knowledge. But like I was saying, you see, even the modern sadhus, most of them, they don't, they have neither vairagya nor vidya nor do they even think that they should have any vairagya or vidya. Of course they're not all like that but I'm saying that that tendency is increasing more and more. Another thing I'm seeing of course generally the culture degrades first in North India and then gradually in South India but in North India I'm gradually seeing more and more the pujaris in the temple in pants and shirts. In the temple not when they're outside when they're supposed to be Right in the temple. In Dwarka, I went in one temple, I saw the pujari there in Pantancha. I said, what, what are you, a pujari in Pantancha? I said, well, I'm the only pujari here. I, it's all, it, all the burdens on me. Uh, what's that got to do? You can still wear dhoti. <laughs> so our movement is meant, yeah, it's a philosophical, cultural, educational movement for 
the spiritualization of the world. So all members of this Krishna conscious movement should take up this philosophy, culture, education, and actual spiritual life. Practically, we see that our grihastas, they're in terms of actual spiritual practice, they're more they're, they're more spiritually advanced than many of the so-called sadhus of the modern age. See, even our grihastas, they rise in Brahma Mahurta. They don't watch TV. They uh, they don't take tea or coffee, and they have uh, sadhana of chanting the holy names, and they study shastra. So this is actual spiritual philosophy, culture, and education. So our devotees, they should be ideal and set an example to the world. Otherwise, you see the modern Vedic culture, it's very weak. And the uh, some people are lamenting, you see, people are getting converted to become Christians and Muslims. But it's not, uh, it's not surprising if you see that the, the, those who are supposed to be the leaders of Hinduism, they themselves, they're they don't have any commitment to it. And they just divert people's devotion to themselves. You see, the Christians say, worship Jesus. The Muslims say, worship Allah. But most Hindu swamis, they say, worship me. So, and they, they don't have anything to offer anyone. They're just, uh, it's just open cheating, but people are attracted to that. But mostly they go after all the rich people. Then, uh, then they become surprised that all the uh, poor people, they're all converting to become Christians. So actually our movement, we're not in competition with Christians or Muslims. And we're not in competition with these self-promoters, these people who promote themselves, these so-called swamis. We just want to promote what is the actual truth for the benefit of others. In that way, uh, we are at odds or in, we have a difference with everyone in the world. We, uh, we have, uh, you know, we, 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 we want to, uh, if, if we point out what is the actual proper way of living, then we have to say that the, the Hindus are misled, the Christians are misled, the Muslims are misled. Christian, Muslim, Hindu, that's not the question. What is the, who is actually God? What is our duty toward Him? This we should understand. Close the slaughterhouses. Don't talk about God with blood dripping down your beard. What's the point of fighting over this religion's better? Or they're all, they're all worse than useless because they're all killing thousands and millions of animals. So this movement is meant for teaching the truth and living according to the truth. That means uh, with vairagya, non-attachment, and vidya, actual knowledge. So all the Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jain, Buddhist, Parsi, Sikh, whatever it may be, atheist, there's no vairagya and there's no vidya. So we're not really in competition. It's not like our religion, we're going to beat your religion. This is all ignorance to say such things. But rather we want to give uh, actual knowledge, actual philosophy, actual culture, actual education for the actual spiritualization of the world. Otherwise people are fighting this religion, that religion. They're all a long, long way away from God. So study Srila Prabhupada's books. Just take this first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. This one verse. Can anyone recite that? Has anyone learned that? Who's learned that verse? Janmadhyasya yaton vayaditara tashcharteshva vignya swarat tene brahma hridaya adi kaveye mu hyanti yat surya tejo vari mridang yata vinimeyo yatra trisago mersha dhamnas dhamna svena sada nirasta kuhakam satyang parang dhimehi. Just listen. This, this is actual knowledge. I think you're. Yeah. Is that the first. Canto part one. Yeah. So, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. I offer, I offer my obeisances to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the son of Vasudev. No, you, uh, wait a minute. I, I'll say it. And then you can, uh, you can then read the, t- tele, I'm, the Telugu translation will be better than my, it'll be more systematic than my mental translation. 
Uh, he is the source of, I mean, just in this one term, Janmadhyas Yayataha, there's like oceans of philosophical understanding right there in that. I guess you can translate that. He is the source of all emanations. The absolute truth is the source of all emanations. Which means that uh, implicit in this statement, Janmadi, means that he is... Uh, he, he underlines the creation, maintenance, and destruction of all the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of everything. He knows everything. All his purposes are, are fulfilled according to his own desire. He is uh, not dependent on anyone. He is completely independent. He instructed the at, at the beginning of the universe, he imparted the Vedic knowledge to Brahma through his heart. And by him, all the, uh, even the great personalities of the universe, they are bewildered. Just like in an illusion, people are, they, they, uh, they see, uh, water in fire, or fire, fire in, or water in fire, or, or earth, uh, yeah, in, just like in a mirage, they see, just like a mirage, they see that. Uh, actually, all these words can be interpreted in various ways. Uh, and they take this world, which is manifested in three phases of time, or three modes of material nature, they don't understand it properly. They take it to be true, but it's not the actual reality. But his own abode in which he always resides, that is free from any such maya. Eternally. He is the ultimate truth. Okay. Nizam. Nizam. Yeah, but that's not. Satyam is a better word. Okay. All right. Okay, read it out now. So it's not very easy to understand, is it? But if we can understand it, then our life is perfect in all respects. Srila Prabhupada has explained all the points in his books very clearly so that we can understand. So please read this Srimad Bhagavatam. It's a great treasure. It's uh, the actual purpose of human life is served by reading Srimad Bhagavatam. Not the Deccan Chronicle or what's the Telugu papers? Uduaivani or something? Hmm? Inaru or whatever. Read the Srimad Bhagavatam. If you don't have Srimad Bhagavatam in your home, you should have. We have a, if you don't have Bhagavatam in your home, there's something missing. People think, I need in my home AC, fridge, washing machine, all the facets of modern life. And of course, a big dog, that's the most important thing. If your home doesn't stink of dogs, then you're just backward. You're, you're from the old age. So we say, throw out the dog and bring in God. Bring in Srimad Bhagavatam. Actually, a fridge, it's not a good idea at all. That means you're just keeping rotten food. Get fresh food. Cook every time fresh for Krishna. Okay, we can solve... There's a serious problem in your life if you're not reading Srimad Bhagavatam. So we have the solution to the problem. It's on the book table. If you don't have Bhagavatam in your home, you should have. So take a set or two home. Hare Krishna. All glory is to Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Hare Krishna. Alright, this session is over.